four. Hello, welcome to another Love Rugby League Weekly. Here we are at Love Rugby League Towers, delighted to be joined by James Gordon. I'm, of course, Dave Parkinson. Uh, James, interesting all week we've had in Rugby League. Every week's interesting, Dave, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah. You've been missing for a couple of these. I know, I, was wondering. I know. We were sending out the search parties and everything. Yeah. I got a position set up for you a couple of weeks ago. No, no, you know me, Dave. You know me, busy man, busy man and all that. But yeah, we're... Uh, yeah, interesting. Obviously, we had the uh, Super League Dream Team. Right, let's start there. Let's yeah, start with that. We'll, we'll, have okay. a, we'll, we'll have a, a five-minute conversation regarding that. Yeah, um, I've heard since my last appearance you've got this shot clock in. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what. Let me set it. Hang on. I need to reset it To now. stop us waffling. To on. stop us waffling and to keep us on target. So let me, uh, let me reset it. So you're going to go... So let's give us five minutes. Five minutes so on Dream five Team. Five minutes right, on Dream okay. Team. So, yeah, um, obviously there yesterday, uh, me and Drew went... Uh, Old Trafford and um, yeah, good do good. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, getting stuff, uh, speaking to the coaches and players ahead of this weekend as well. Um, the dream team itself, I think. I mean, you can't have too many arguments with it. I've seen a few. Uh, I've seen a few irate Casford fans complaining that Paul McShane's not in it, but I think. If Roby's up for Man of Steel, he's got to be the, the hooker in the dream team. So Could Milner have had a shot as well at loose forward? I was looking at these loose forwards because we're naming this 35-year-old. He gets in every year, almost by default, regardless of how many games he plays. Well, we were talking about this, and I was a bit... I, and, I, and I tweeted this last night, is can you name five loose forwards? Because, well, I can't. Because, the because nobody identifies as a loose forward really anymore. They're all middles, aren't they? Yeah, they're, you know, they're extra prop forwards, aren't they? Yeah, because you know, it's like Leeds are a good example where Cuthbertson's played a lot of games at 13, hasn't he? Um, you know, St. Helens have McCarthy scars, but playing at 13 sometimes, and it's like, no one really identifies as a loose forward anymore. You've either got a prop playing there, or effectively a second rower who's you know, just an extra extra player. Milner at Cass is probably one, but I mean, he was a hooker, wasn't he? That he was originally, effectively, yeah. Effectively, yeah. he's... I suppose he's got to the point of playing 13 because they've got McShane who can, you know, play the play the full 80 or whatever. And before that, they had Daz Clark yeah. as well, didn't they? So. so I think Milner's almost become a 13 just because that gets him in the team. Um, I think a few others that people said was, uh, was Joe Westerman. See, now Joe's only played half a season but, at Super Well, yeah, but I mean, you'd, 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 I think he's only played two games, I think, but you'd... Uh, oh, sorry, you'd, I, was doing him a, do, I was doing him great service, he, though, not he, a disservice. He'd, he'd identify as a 13, I suppose. Um, I think Mark Flanagan is another one who maybe you would at a push, but yeah, very sort of thin on the ground in terms of 13s, which then, you know, we, you know not, not taking anything away from Sean O'Loughlin, who's obviously a, a great player. But, oh, he's a fine player. But he's obviously almost getting into it by default because he's like the only player that identifies as a loose forward and who is, you know, relatively good, I suppose. <laughs> uh, if you was going to chuck, say, like, another prop, though, into that position, would you have gone with another prop? Um, uh, and, and who would it be? Because I've always liked that Millington me at Castleford. I, I mean, we were talking, I mean, it was interesting, that obviously, there was no Castleford and no Warrington players in there, mm -hmm. um, given that they've both finished in top four. Um I suppose it depends what side of the fence you sit on with that because I think I, my sort of attitude to it is that a team's only as good as the sum of its parts and mm. it's like you can have, you know, is it better to have 13 players who are all 8 out of 10 <laughs> than it is to have 4 or 5 who are 9 or 10 out of 10 and then the rest are 5 or 6 out of 10, do you know what I mean? And I think maybe that's where Warrington and Casford have sort of been this season. Yeah, yeah, where it's been um, collectively. Yeah, than... and I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not saying that that's not being the case in... You know, in other teams, but I think that makes it harder for one of them, one of their players, to stand out as like the league's best in that position. Okay, okay. What do you make of the rest of the team? Because I was, I was quite happy with it to be honest. You know, two poos had a, a smashing season. Johnston's had a cracking. Season yeah, it's, I mean, well. it's, uh, Michael Carter from Wakefield was there. I had a really good chat with him actually um, yesterday and uh, on Monday and. Uh, he was delighted, obviously, to have the recognition that they... And it's great for Wakefield to have the recognition of those those three players in the team. They um, deserved it, and people would say that they deserved it over the last couple of years because they've been there or thereabouts. Yeah, I mean, they? they finished fifth last two seasons, and, you know, if they finish fifth next season, they'll be in playoffs, so um, they'll be happy with that. I mean, like I say, Tupu, you can't really argue with the stats, you know, that he's got. He's, he's made most metres, hasn't he, I think, in the in Super League. And, you know, Johnston's one of them players that I think is on the radar of everybody, and that was one of the things Michael Carter said to me, actually, that... The culture and, um, and what they've built at Wakefield is actually attractive for players to stay. Mm -hmm. And they know realistically that 
clubs will want their players, but they're hoping that what they've built at Wakefield will be enough to, to keep them to stay. And if you look at, you know, you look at Johnson, and I'm sure, you know, he, he's in the dream team. Okay, yeah, you could say, well, you know, they've not won any silverware and they've not been in any finals, but <laughs> it's almost like the potential's there for them for them to do that, especially if they can get the new ground and all that sorted out. He's had a fantastic season. All the guys that have had fantastic seasons are the seven from St. Helens as well. Did it surprise you that so many were called up? Um, I think we, we were talking on the way and we thought Barber, obviously, we thought Percival, we thought Makinson. I, I was surprised that both Lomax and Richardson got in. I, I thought... I like Lomax, so I think he's had a storm in you. Yeah, I, th I mean, we were looking at maybe would Truman get a, get a, a shout for good it. Good shout, yeah, um, yeah, good shout. You know, maybe as one of the two, and obviously Roby Thompson. You can't really argue with with those. Okay, hey, I can't believe it. You're on time. Ah. I'm liking it because that's going to go off any second. <laughs> now, there, there you, go. you go. I'll tell you what, I wouldn't like to wake up in your house, Dave. <laughs> I've got four of those. <laughs> That's where it is because I never, I never wake up straight away. <laughs> right, let us uh, let, let us move on to other things. We have been sent a couple of, uh, or I've been sent a couple of of messages of uh, things to have a chat about. We will get on to the games, by the way. Um, and what one thing that has come up over a couple of them is, <laughs> well, we'll start with this one. From Matthew Horton, he says, "Will Featherstone and Lee be 17 aside this week? Both sides been really, really struggling with injuries, with various other things that have been going on behind the scenes at both clubs. Um, should we really be playing this game now? Is there's a real welfare issue for me? I think it's a disgrace, Dave. To be honest, I, I mean, I understand that they've both finished out of the top four, and I understand that you know there's there's money cuts, but how can you cut? How can you cut your team to an extent where?" Because we're still in the season, mm -hmm. you know. As much as as much as people want to call it, you know, as much as the championship shield, championship shields a meaningless competition, it's still you're it's still a playing. Yeah, you're still, There's still playing games. Prize money, yeah, grabs, and, and you know, players are still wanting to get paid, and to to rock up with twelve players, I think, is a disgrace. When you when you're someone like Lee at thirteen, uh, well, yeah, but, but finishing with eleven, finishing with eleven, uh, I think I just think it's a disgrace. Um, you know, they had, you know, as much as. I know Derek put his own money in, but they've still had the central funding that they had. They still had the five hundred thousand pound parachute payment. For them to not be able to see out the season with a full team of players is is, is shambolic. And I think, you know, and, and obviously there's other things going on there where players are being let down, other contracts and stuff, perhaps. And, and I, I just think I understand from Derek's point of view, from a business point of view, that you know he's decided to pull his money out but for them to be in this situation now is just i mean it does raise some questions about i know a few people have been saying you should be able to register mm -hmm. amateur players and especially there's a lot of amateur teams now coming towards the end of yeah, their season i mean well. I, was, I was thinking actually i thought you know maybe they should they should do a rule where you can register players who've not played for a professional team in that year all right okay you know what i mean so yeah. like you could register someone who's not played for anyone else in the whole year at any point that would real jordan tansy out i think he's only had the one club this year up at working time. yeah I mean, but I, but i think what that means is it stops like it being abused right okay do you know what i mean because you're looking at play, you know, unless it's someone who's been injured or something who's been out for a while. You're not, you know, with all due respect to the amateur players, you're not going to be pulling an Andrew Johns out of the bag for the last four or five games of the season. Well, I remember having a, uh, it was a, it was a brief chat a few weeks ago with Kieran Pertle over at Lee, and he was saying that, yeah, maybe he could have gone over and he could have signed half a dozen from Lee Minus, but that would have completely derailed their season. Well, that's the thing. So he's being honourable and yeah, being honest and, that, and, and being thing. up front. I feel, I feel a bit sorry for Pertle. Like, I mean, realistically, Lee were the second best team in the championship, apart if you take that first five or six games out. They were the second best team and obviously they've not managed to get in the four and then, you know, all the funding shenanigans that's happened after that. But I, I just you know, feel sorry for Pertle really because he's done an OK job and he, he sort of, it's almost blotting his copybook a little mm. bit because, you know, they're getting paid, they've had a couple of pastings, haven't they, in the, in the Shield. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just so disappointing that, you know, in all the talk about what's going on, you've got a team, you've got a club with the rich heritage of Lee that... Are only rocking up to a game with 12, 13 players, you know, and the, and it, go, it only brings back the argument of, you know, should reserve teams be mandatory, should academy teams be mandatory, you know, all that sort of thing to but, make sure. But then again, you're, you're still you're still hammering at the same pool, so you'd still be weakening all yeah, your amateur, amateur game team, anyway, yeah. wouldn't you? Yeah. You know, so it, it's 
Is you know, it, I, and it's also as well, you know, whilst there, um, I'm sure there might be people watching this who'd say, you know what, I'd really fancy playing semi-professionally at Lee. Um, I don't think they're beating the door down in the same way that they had to get to St Helens, to get to Warrington, to get to Wigan, to get to Leeds. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I think, I think, I think the way that the game's been over the past sort of ten years, I think it's like because it, rugby league's lost its way a little bit. I think mm-hmm. that's impacted on the pathway for players and and the way players look at it and um, and things like that. It's just, it's just a shame, really. I think that you know, you look at you know, realistically, Liam Featherston are what. 16th, 17th best team mm-hmm. in the in the Northern Hemisphere, if you like, and they can't even field a full team. Um, you know, and West Wales are getting grief, but I mean, West Wales are at least they're from an expansion area that are trying to develop. Well, this is it, and you know, I, I think I commented on on Twitter at the weekend. Lee have joined the ranks of West Wales and Hemel in not yeah, in only naming 13 men. It's never been that bad as yeah, far as players in, in all the history, despite all the issues that Lee might have had. Because I mean, I've described them as a little bit of a bipolar club, really. That's yeah, what it feels like supporting them. Yeah, yeah. They've been up, they've been down, they've been up, they've been down, and the the lows are really low, and the highs are like the highest of the highs. Well, it's like a pride thing, though, isn't it? I mean. You know, you you know, you think of all the players and all the teams that Lee have had, and then the club's almost like letting itself down. Mm. You know, where's its pride in Lee as a club and as a brand? That Which I suppose you could also chuck at Featherston the fact that they've been short on numbers too, because I think they only had fourteen against Lee the other week. It works, doesn't it? I do like it. <laughs> right, the show's okay. all on the B, like twenty minutes long. <laughs> 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 it's keeping us it's keeping us honest though, yeah, that's what it is. Uh right, let's have a look and see what else I've been sent. Uh I got sent a, a something from Howard. He said that I I, I was saying how the, the Dream Team shirt looks a little bit like a Newcastle Knights one from back in the day and I, I put a copy of it on my Twitter account yesterday and he's come back he loves those type of retro shirts. Yeah, I think um, I seen. A, I think someone messaged us on Facebook actually asking where they can buy them because I would love to them. have it. Yeah, I'd love to. It'd go great with a pair of jeans. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It is, to be fair, I was a bit like you know being all victim Eldrew as I am. I was saying, why do they have a dream team shirt? Because they never wear it. And obviously, they have it for the dream team. Lots. I'm like, why don't they just rock up at the dream team in their club's kits? That's what oh, I think, actually, yeah. you know, and have it in the picture where you've got the seven, you could have had the seven Saints kits, it's good for the sponsors of the, the clubs. And, uh, well, maybe do it like the bar bars do, where the, where the, shirts, uh, where the socks yeah. of the amateur clubs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that'd that'd be funny, because it's it? like, why did they make a shirt and then they don't, they don't play in it? <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, unless they're gonna, unless they're, I mean, the good thing about the Super League Dream Team is at least there's 13 in it, unlike the ridiculous NRL Dream Team, which only has nine plus a sub. Uh, well, that's because we know that those Aussies are much better. Uh, they're not something they could probably beat us with. Ten. Well, they could, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, how can you have a Dream Team with nine and a sub? I mean, they got to ten. They might as well just get to thirteen because they're only three off anyway. So why not? <laughs> Could you imagine them doing it in football? Could you imagine them having a football? Five uh, aside? Yeah. Best defender? Yeah, best they, yeah they'd have, they could have, they just never do it. You'd have, you could have best fullback, best centre-back, best centre-mid, <laughs> and they'd end up with like six. How can you have that as the dream team? So at least you could get something right. Um, Christian's come to us. I think this deserves to go on the, the, oh, the, the shot clock, clock, actually. Right. Yeah, so I'm going to start it because he's wanting us to discuss the game in Cumbria and should there be a Cumbrian Super League side. I mean, the, de- the, the debate's been done to death in, in many ways, hasn't it, um, about Cumbria? I mean, we'd all love to see a strong Cumbrian team. There's obviously a lot of strong, cum- you know, real good quality Cumbrian players. The amateur game is probably at its strongest in Cumbria, I would oh, say. Well, you look at all these teams that are winning playoffs, getting through to playoff finals, getting in semi-finals. The game's on a high, isn't it? And, and I think in many ways, a lot of them players, because of the way that the professional teams have have gone, you've probably got a lot of players who would have played for Whitehaven and Workington many moons ago are probably now sticking with the amateur teams instead because... Whitehaven, Workington, and you know maybe not Barrow, but have lost the sort of prestige and the mm. you know the, because they've lost their way. You know, obviously Workington. You know, with all due respect, would you rather play for Wathbrow and you know be successful and play local teams, or play for Whitehaven and have to go to West Wales and Hemel and all that? Because don't forget these lads. You know, they're all working lads. It's like, do you want to give up? You know, your, your weekend to you know sit on a bus for for probably I don't know eight nine hours both ways just to play rugby when you can play for Wathbrow up the road um, but then they've still got the same issue going away to away matches haven't they yeah they have but it's not as extreme as the 
as the White Haven and, and working since oh, I don't know. If you've been to Wathbrow or Egremont, <laughs> tell you what, it's, it's like go get up to White Haven and turn left. Well, I know, but you know what I mean. It's not. It's not quite as. And obviously, the pressure's a bit lower. You're playing with your mates. There's not as much sort of like. You know, there's not as much commitment, I suppose, from it. But I think, I mean, obviously the problem's always been the facilities, hasn't it? And I think, you know, you look at where Whitehaven were when Steve McCormack was there. So that's what, pushing 13 years ago yep. now. Yep. Um, that was probably when it was at its peak for, for Whitehaven, certainly. Um, it'd be interesting to see if Workington could manage it this you know, managed to get promoted just to see, because Leon Price is obviously doing a fair job there. It'd be interesting to see if he can give them that the other kick. I know there's talks of a stadium, a new stadium in Workington with the football team and, and stuff like that. So it's like, I think it's going to take one of either Workington or Whitehaven to really get their act together to make it work. At, my opinion always was that, you know, you'd be better trying to create a new club. The, well, the two. You, you then don't have all those, all those intricacies that are between the towns, do you? And yeah, that, that rivalry. But I think, I think, I think I would have looked at it and thought, if there's enough of a demand for Super League in Cumbria, mm -hmm. that you'd, you'd retain Whitehaven and Workington, and effectively have them feeding into the franchise, if you like, um, and. You know, and, and you'd make sure that there was never a clash. So, for instance, the Cumbrian franchise would be at home on the weekend that Whitehaven and Workington weren't at home. Um, whether that works now because of the way Super League is, it, it probably yeah. won't. Because if Cumbria got relegated and then you've yeah. got Cumbria, Whitehaven, and Workington yeah. at the same <laughs> yeah, league, yeah, it yeah, never yeah. worked. But so I think realistically now, I think the ship's almost sailed for that idea, and I think. You're basically looking at either Workington or Whitehaven. Uh, doing one it of themselves. those clubs doing it themselves. Yeah. I mean, let's not discount Barrow. I mean, Barrow's not that far away, is it, from 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 us? No, we yeah, I think an hour and a half up the road from where we're filming from. Yeah, I think. I mean, I've spoke to the Barrow chairman, and know they've had some difficulties this season because mm. they got they got let down by a, by a sponsor. And you know, they're they're probably in a in a decent place. You know, in terms of. You know they're in the championship. They've, they're fairly consolidated, and um, you know obviously they always get chucked into the whole Cumbria merger type thing. But they're far too. It's too far away. So I almost sort of think Barrow. Barrow could stand on their own two feet. I'm sure. I know mm. there's there's issues in Barrow as well in with a stadium as well because obviously the football team play elsewhere, and it's like I know that the rugby club get offered for their ground quite a lot. But it's like can they sort something out? It's all about facilities, isn't it? At the end of the day, neither of those, none of them three teams have got a facility. That's Although you do mention this, and obviously we still got Castleford and Wakefield <laughs> yeah, yeah. in ransackle places. <laughs> We're all right this side of the Pennines. We've got yeah. it sorted, haven't we? But get it sorted out, we Yorkshire. Yeah, you're right. You are right. Well, that it was interesting. I, I mentioned Mark Carr again uh, just because I had a really good chat with him yesterday and he was saying they're doing so well Wakefield but he's really scared if you like of he, he knows that at some point Super League can knock on his door and say we can't have you in Super League anymore because of the ground so that's a real motivation for them to get their stadium issues sorted and he's hopeful by the end of next season that they will have a they'll have started work on something are we due another picture from Castleford or someone in a hard hat with a travel possibly Possibly. Uh, it's been a while since we've had one of them, isn't it? Yeah. Great little conversation. Thank you very much for uh, for sending us that, to be honest. The uh, sound is going to go. So thanks, Christian. Uh, there you go. Um, we've talked a bit about the debacle going on at Lee, which uh, Gaz wanted us to discuss. Um, interesting one here from Michael. He said, if Toronto make it to Super League, will all Super League fans who intend to travel over to Toronto get their trip subsidised? As far as I was aware, if you was going to go over to Toronto, you'd pay full back, and they were subsidising the teams and where they were stopping. Um, yeah, yeah, fans always pay full whack. I think I looked at going... Um a couple of weeks, I think. It, obviously, it depends what time of year you go. Yeah, so if yeah. you get them earlier in the year, it's a lot cheaper. Um, so like, I think when LKR played them, it was quite. It was like upwards of a grand. Okay. Um, whereas I think sort of earlier in the season, it's been more like 600, 700 quid, you know, for the four or five nights. Um, it, it, I mean, my impression always was that um, that Toronto were going to pay for the clubs, but apparently that's not the case. Apparently when they go up into Super League, the Super League clubs are going to be expected to foot the bill to go to Toronto. Are they? Um, which is interesting. Is so this because Toronto will actually get a cut of that money now because they've been self-funding, haven't they, in a lot of ways over this last couple of years? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I, to be honest, it was a surprise to me when I, when I found out um, because, you know, it's like you look at Salford and what seems like, with all due respect, teams like Salford and Wakefield and they're going to be like... 
is a bit, you know what, what you're talking you're probably looking at what 30 grand maybe to at least to get over there that's a, a player for a team Inti, that's a player's contract yeah yeah and that's what i mean and it's like you know i i was almost like you'd almost be better off throwing the game taking the 30 nil defeat and saving the 30 grand to be honest, or whatever it is. to be honest, I think a lot of League One clubs did that last year because they did, they were going over with um, ragtag sides. Yeah, and, yeah, um, and then obviously they were paid. You know, they were paid. You could imagine, and I'd imagine that would have happened if Toronto hadn't paid. Hardly any of them teams would have gone. Mm. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how that all works out with Toronto because I I do think it's going to cause. I do think it's going to cause. You know, you know, we know funds are tight at Salford. They're up for sale what, again, aren't they? Yeah, well, I mean, what if they've not got the cash to do it? You know, they can't magic it out of thin air to, to go to Toronto. So, um, yeah, it's a, I mean, that's always been my concern with the Toronto thing, is that I just don't think it stacks up from a logistical point of view. Um, you know, we talk about the play. You know, we talk about players before. Ultimately, would Liam Featherston be short of players if Toronto weren't taking 25 players out of the pool? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's um, an interesting discussion point. Do you know what I mean? So we could nearly have a we could nearly have a full show on yeah. the whole logistics of the Toronto yeah, set. I mean, obviously, really. I'm obviously better people than me know know um, whether it's going to work or not. But I think I, I've said it before. I think everything's all based on a hypothetical situation. The defence, mm. everyone always gives well. Oh well, there's this big North American market, or there's all these. You know, you've got you could attract loads of broadcast partners or sponsors, and it's like well, there's no proof that that can happen. There's no there's no proof that. A broadcaster is going to come along, or that a sponsor is going to come along. I mean, look at the Denver thing. You know, we got all starry-eyed over over a bloke in Denver for the Test match, and then it's left the RFL like half a million pound out of pocket. And we're at risk of getting all starry-eyed again because Barcelona are supposedly opening the new camp. I mean, anything could happen with that. They might well, get six hundred people there. They might get sixty thousand. But I mean, at least that's a little bit more. There's a little bit more about that because it's Catalan are existing. You know, you'd imagine Catalan probably wouldn't go into it. This reminds me of that film, you know, you know the one with Kevin Costner. Which one? You know the one, build it, they'll come. Oh. Where, he, where he builds the baseball court and he's yeah, back well, I, I mean, yeah, I mean the, that, the new Camp Barcelona thing's ambitious. But having said that, if no, Ka- no, I weren't just talking about. It. I was talking about the no, whole yeah, situation. Yeah, no, yeah, no, no, but general, I think because yeah. if Catalan could get in bed with Barcelona, because I mean, but I mean, but well, the way they're Catalans, aren't they? It's, it's the whole Catalans people. Well, it? the way Barcelona works is they've not. It's not just a football club. They've got basketball. They've got handball, and it's like. They've got they've got the women's team, so it's like the way that a lot of clubs work in Europe is they're like sporting clubs. Mm-hmm. So it's like if Catalan can get into bed with them, you know, could you tap into the Spanish Catalan market, play a few games in Barcelona every year? A bit like a bit like how in rugby union you've got some teams that play. Oh, well, a bit like the NRL, don't mm-hmm. you? Some of the teams play in a couple of grounds. Could you get to a point where Catalan play? I don't know, eight games in Perpignan, four games in. Barcelona or Why whatever. has it took them nine years, though, to go back to Barcelona, though? Because they played against Warrington, didn't they? And it was really successful, years. wasn't it? Was, it yeah. got nearly 20,000 in, didn't well, they? I, think, I mean, I said, I've said before, I thought Catalan lost away a little bit for, for two or three years, so I don't know whether that's impacted on it. I mean, obviously, you've got the stuff like cost, ground availability and um, and all that, but you'd, you'd like... I think, I think one of the problems is you'd like to think there was a strategy behind everything, and obviously, <laughs> it's a good opportunity for Catalan now because they've won the Challenge Cup, and, you know, obviously, that's made Barcelona maybe sit up and realise you know what what being successful in in that sport could do for them so let's see what happens i mean you, you've got you've got to try it i mean the, the thing with that is it's it's not going to cost anyone any money mm-hmm. in terms of you know the rfl have lost half a million or whatever on on the on the denver test match it's one game so it, you know it's not it's not something really you know it's still in catalan it's not like they're moving it to out of Mongolia or whatever, so I, I think it's I, you could be onto something. Yeah. The, what, 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 what's the outer the, Mongolia orangutans or something like that. Yeah, what's the animal? What do you know the animal? Uh, let us know. In fact, share this, share yeah. this post as well. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the, I think, the, and that's the thing for me. I think you look at the, what's the risk and reward, and I think that Catalan to, uh, I think the Catalan in Barcelona thing is quite low risk in comparison to say the Toronto project and the. Uh, the Denver Test Match project. Okay, uh, thanks very much for your comments there. I always find it really interesting to discuss what other people want us to talk about as well because it, it really does help us set an agenda. Let's talk about some action on the field though. So the shot clock is going to start because I'm wondering, you know what, whether we can get the whole stuff done right, on in then. about 10 we'll minutes. Talk, we'll talk fast. There we go. So we're starting off. So we've got 10 minutes to go through the entire lot of fixtures of what happened last weekend. So I want to start with the Catalan Dragons. It seems almost 
like we, we, we scripted that and we planned that we were going to jump from Barcelona into Catalans. Um, they won their final home game of the season, 22 points to 12 against Huddersfield Giants. Davy Mee, four tries, brilliant. Yeah, 12 nil down, weren't they, as well? So uh, turned it round. Uh, good to, I suppose it's always good to sign off with a, with a win, isn't it? And I always, um, I always like a video that goes viral as well, because there was one which was all about Michael McAloram's dogs, because they were allowed to take all the kids oh, and yeah, on the field, yeah. weren't they? And Michael took his dogs on. Is that Was that Catalan's first win as well in the Super 8s, was it? Or did they, they pick one up? Um, did they beat... Did they beat did they beat Hull? No, oh, they beat Hull, yeah. They beat Hull, didn't they? They beat Hull a couple of weeks ago. I was just ago. trying to think, because I knew... Because obviously Hull lost all seven of theirs. We'll get on to them in a minute, I suppose. But, um. uh, well, yeah, let's go there now, because yeah. uh, you've gone from, uh, as you mentioned, a team that's lost all seven of theirs to a team that's won all seven of their fixes in Wigan. They were looking in pretty good shape, it must be said. I know they're boring the pants off everybody at the moment, because the, the entertainment value of watching a Wigan team at the moment isn't really there for me. I've fallen asleep the last two times I've been on telly, you know. Well, I think, I, I mean, I said that. I, I, I saw Wigan a quite a few times in the first few weeks of the season, and I thought... They weren't pulling up any trees, but I thought the way that they were set up, and I said this back in like April, the only team that'll stop St Helens winning it is Wigan. Mm. Now, and I, I still stand you. by that. I agree with um, you. Yeah, yeah. Because I, like, I remember, I remember they played. Um, I went to a few, but I remember that the, they played Widnes, and Widnes were beating them sixteen nil, like just before half time. And um, but you could tell when you was at the game, even though they were getting beat six, I know it sounds daft, but even though they were getting beat sixteen nil, they had all the attacking set plays and you know, they were all set up really well. It just wasn't quite coming off them and you knew that at some point it was gonna it was gonna happen for them and obviously they ended up winning that game quite easy in the end. And, and I think that's what they've been like. I think they've they've stuck to the process and they've been, you know, fairly uh you know, they've been fairly consistent. Um, I'm going to say what I said last week, and Andrew pulled his face at me. I'm going to say they'll 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 win this grand final by boring St Helens to sleep. <laughs> well, well, I mean, it doesn't matter. No one remembers if it was boring or not, Dave. They remember who wins. So, uh, I've, I've, there's some, been some forgettable grand finals. I have to. Um, admit. But I, you know, I think yeah, I, I I'd probably tip Wigan to win the whole thing at the moment. Um, I just hope for their sake that this whole heartache of shenanigans doesn't overshadow it because you know obviously it's, I think they've done I think Wigan have done a fair job at sort of playing it down so far but I think the case that he's in court is either the, a couple of days before the grand final I think so yeah so it's like you know that's far from ideal for Wigan to have that I mean I would imagine that he's been told I mean I don't know but I would imagine he's been told to stay away from from training and whatnot. This will this will um, sound like we're on repeat from last year well that's what I mean and I think I think I mean I don't think Sean Wayne's not daft enough to I don't. I, I think he's too shrewd to let it affect him. I think as soon as it's happened, I, I don't, you know, because it was always a little bit of a strange one that they had him training with him. I thought because I understand that obviously he can train. Yeah, he's got to bed in with them though. But well, yeah, but I understand that. But I mean, Wayne's not going to be there. Tom Kids ain't going to be there. Bateman's not going to be there. And it's like all these guys are getting towards the end of a season where they're trying to win. Super League and then they've got like Zach Hardik coming in still banned can't really help him but he's training with him and I just I was a bit like for me I thought that was a bad decision I think I would have just said to him look this has happened before though when people's been banned I mean I, I seem to recall something with um, for example Sean Penkovic was training when he got banned first of all he was then training ahead of coming back with the club yeah I mean I, I think it would have been fine if he was coming back like middle of the season like I think Hock I think Gareth Hock did it when he was at Wigan. I'm sure his band finished in like the June or July. Now that makes sense. You know, Barber at Saints last season. It makes sense because he's going to contribute to that that season and those players. Whereas I think, but he's on contract from next season, isn't he? So yeah, basically from I, from November, I think. And it's it? like ultimately, he's not. You know, half of them players aren't going to be there. The coach isn't going to be there, and it's a bit like. You know, rugby league's fairly small anyway. You can't tell me that Hardacre doesn't know all, who all the Wigan lads are anyway. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to get buried down with the Hardacre thing because I just want to just say, <coughs> Zach, you stupid pillock. <laughs> I said it last year. What have you done it for? Right, let's move on. I've had enough of him. Um, right, Ben Barber, man back in form, two tries, and St. Ellen's nil in Castleford, 26 points nil. Impressive before the playoffs. Yeah, interesting to put a mark. I mean, you can't read a great deal into it, but I'm sure uh, Justin Albrook will be happy that they've they've put that sort of mark down. If you remember, you know, we had a really we had a really great semi final, didn't we, between Saints and Castle last season? So, um, you know, that could be a you know it's a potential grand final matchup, Saint Helens Castleford. But I think you know I think it'll be Saint Helens Wigan. Okay, and uh, finally, as far as this particular segment of Super X is concerned, Wakefield Trinity twenty three, Warrington Wolves thirty six. Um, 
Right in Hampshire, celebrating his new contract with an 11 point haul, try three goals and a drop goal for Wakefield, but they found six try Warrington, two strong, and I saw that try from Ben Murdoch Masilla, and that was something a bit special, wasn't it? Yeah, I think um, I think Warrington have been a bit scratchy, but I think they can. I think they've got a chance. You know, I think uh, someone was talking yesterday. Were they, are they 15? I'm trying to think what odds somebody said. They're like, they're like 15 to two or something to win at Saints or something. So is this worth is... me while actually sticking a pound on? Yeah, I think I'm not going to so, risk much yeah. more because I'm not much um, of a betting man. Warrington certainly the underdogs, but I think they've got more of a chance than maybe some people are giving them. I think I think a word on Wakefield as well. I mean, if you consider that Wakefield really have had nothing to play for in in the Super Eights, they've mm-hmm. been really competitive. You know, when you compare like what Hull and Catalan have maybe been like, I think it's a credit to Wakefield that they've managed to, you know, still ruffle some feathers in in the Super Eights. And you know, they finished fifth two seasons running. If they finish fifth next season, they'll be in playoffs, and you know, potentially got a route to the grand final. Qualifiers. Hull Kingston Rovers are winning. That was a really strange one. Thirty points to nil. They had it sewn up. They had to win by so many points due to how everything else finished. They should never have been in that position, should they? Of having to almost be in a position to throw a game to ensure that they get loads of money for next season. Well, I mean, I, I mean, my opinion on it is I'd be more suspicious if it, if Widnes had won. <laughs> right. Okay. So that was my position. I, I think I think some people got a bit carried away with that parachute payment thing because I think. You know, the chances of Widnes winning that match or not losing by 14 were slim to none. I mean, they've not won away in the whole of 2018. Mm-hmm. They've lost 21 of the last 22 matches. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't. You know, and Hull KR is a tough place to go at, at the best of times. Um, so yeah, sorry season for Widnes and um, put out the misery now. Congratulations to Salford Red Devils. They secured their Super League spot with a resounding 44-10 victory against Toulouse Olympique on Thursday. I really enjoyed watching that game, I have to say, with uh, the way that Toulouse approached it, because they were wanting to try and get around Salford. Uh, and the way that Salford played as well, Jackson Hastings is, is something a little bit special. Yeah, I really like how Toulouse play, and I think um, it's a shame I would have liked to have seen them go up um, mm. into Super League, because I think they just add something a bit different. I think... The, Gaelic the, Fleur. Yeah, and I think... The, I think the problem that they've, I think the problem to lose have got is obviously the way they play leaves them a bit open, doesn't it? And I or is think it more French for Fre- Ga- Gaelic? No, is, it Ga- is it Gaelic? Ga- Gaelic. I think you're right. I Gaelic. think you're right. Am I, am I right? Someone, to someone, can, someone, 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 right. Bus, right. Um, I, I, I really like how to lose play. The problem they've got is it, it, it almost becomes a bit, a bit like they've got to score a lot of points because they concede a lot of points. Um, and I think they found that in some of the games. I was a bit worried for actually on Saturday because I thought, you know, they sort of let it get away from him, didn't they, towards the end, like last 15, yeah, 20 they minutes, they shipped a load of points. And when Halifax were beating London, you were sort of thinking, Toulouse are going to regret this because if they'd have lost by 10 less points, they'd have snuck, snuck into a million pound game. I mean, it didn't matter in the end because London, as we know, beat Halifax 23-16. So, um, but yeah, I, I would have liked to see Toulouse come up. I said it a few weeks ago. I, I think it'd been a, it's a, it would have been a good opportunity for Super League to have the two French teams in. And I think, you know, I think Toulouse have the makings of a squad where they only need maybe four or five to be competitive in, in, in Super League and um, you know you, they've had some good results haven't they in the, in, in the qualifiers um, Two words for London Broncos Jared Sammer match winner well, Yeah Four actually but <laughs> <laughs> London, I mean London again I think I think for them to have been in this position is, is quite extraordinary, really. Oh, and they've great. got a really got yeah. they've got a really good chance. And don't forget, you know, to, you know, I think to, did Toulouse beat Witness and Ulkar, didn't they? Mm-hmm. Um, London have beat Witness and Salford. Toronto have beat Witness and Leeds. See, this is all working, and they've booted it into touch. Well, you say that, it. Dave, but I think um, I think it's the, the what they've done is the right the right thing. I mean, I think I look at you look at Toronto, say mm-hmm. right, Toronto best team in Championship, finished eight points clear. You know, they only lost, they lose one, one or two. Um, then they've won five out of seven in qualifiers, including two Super League teams, and yet they've still got to win one match to get promoted. And I just think is that you know it, that's tough. You know what I mean? You could have done away with the million pound game and just had your top four get promoted back into Super League. There you go. Well, yeah, they could have done that. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, it'd be interesting. It'd be interesting one this Sunday. You know, obviously Toronto, London. I've got two words regarding Toronto as well. Gaz O'Brien, fantastic. Yeah, always good to have that in your uh, in your armory. Uh, a drop goal specialist, especially in a t- in a tight game as that. It was a shame for them that it actually didn't make much of a difference to them um, winning at Leeds because obviously. You know, they didn't make top three. We're going to beep in a in a second. Um, it's quite, 
you know, you look at there's four teams that have got ten. You know, Toronto got ten points, five wins out of seven, and that still wasn't enough. You know, they're still in the million pound game, and that's that's quite extraordinary for me. That it is, yeah. Um, right, we'll quickly go through these Championship Shield ones. Um, Batley got over the top of Swinton. Couple of tries for Jeffrey. He's a man in right form at the moment. All signed up for next season, of course. I think that Matt Diskin's going to have a really good team next year. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, Batley were Batley have been in that. They've had nothing to play for, have they? Because they were, you know. They're in like no man's land because they're so far behind Lee and Featherstone, but then they're so far ahead of everybody else. Um, but Swinton, a real poor result for them because that now means that they've finished, they finished bottom. Um, you know, and for them, they got that lifeline of survival, didn't they? And then they've almost like, they've almost like chucked it away. And um, you know, they'll find it really tough against either Bradford or Workington to to survive. Dewsbury had uh, a nine-try victory against Lee, two tries for Aaron Brown. We've seen Dewsbury a couple of times, haven't we, uh, together this yeah. season. And a couple of tries there for Guzdek as well. I think that just um, rounds up just how competitive we know that Dewsbury can be. And it's just a shame Neil Kelly's not going to be around next season to oversee it. Yeah, I mean, interesting one. They, they sort of lost their way a bit, Dewsbury, didn't they, in the middle of the season um, after starting fairly well. And, you know, Neil, we saw him a few times, and Neil Kelly did seem a bit frustrated at times, didn't mm. he? Um, it's always sad, you know, I, you know, I got on well with Neil Kelly, like Neil Kelly. It's sad to see him sort of decide to walk away. It'll be interesting to see who Dewsbury go with uh, for next season. You mentioned Swinton getting brought dragged into it all, but what about Rochdale Hornets? I mean, that was almost like Mission Impossible. You could hear the music going in the background, I think, over the last 10 minutes, especially when they scored uh, late tries as well through um, Tyler Whitaker got Tyler Whitaker yeah. yeah Tyler Whitaker got the winner and uh, my favourite player in the um, championship Joe, Joe Tierra yeah I think great player I mean I mean because yeah, I mean obviously they were dead and buried weren't they rushed Earl, um, dead and buried because obviously the bottom two were going down and they were that far adrift and then you know this lifeline got thrown in and that almost like perked them up but they were still in a pretty sticky situation mm. and they've had to win they've won two really good games haven't they really interesting as well that obviously Alan Kilshaw quit or said he was leaving at the end of the season when it looked like they were well when they'd been definitely relegated and then all of a sudden it's like oh actually you're not you've still got a chance I spoke to him actually and I said well would you change your mind and he said oh he'd already decided he wanted to move on and yeah, yeah he was looking at other things obviously they've appointed Carl Forster now for next season which is a great um, move for them as well I know I, to be honest, I th briefly last week yeah I thought when Forster left Whitehaven I thought that's probably where he'd end up um it's certainly uh, saving uh, on his fuel bill did, isn't did it? I miss Whitehaven announce who did Whitehaven announce yesterday they are they are announcing it I thought it was yesterday did they not say it was yesterday is it not? <laughs> is it not today when we're? Oh, I don't know. We're doing this on well, Tuesday. Well, I, I wondered whether Kilshaw might end up white. Even you see that, so all I was. Uh, by the time you watch this, maybe that will all have been revealed. Yeah, well, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. We'll, we'll see. see. But there's bound to be a story, and we'll we'll talk about it next week, I think. Um, finally, and taking nothing away from Featherstone Rovers beating Barrow Raiders 34-6. Quick word on Barrow because they have survived in the championship of their own volition this season, uh, and then a quick word on Featherstone for the way yeah. they're warming up at the end of the final. Barrow. The big thing for Barrow is they started really well, didn't they? They got some points on the board early, and that meant that instead of sort of scrapping. They were always a bit had everyone at arm's length. I think they got to 15 points really quick in the season, and they didn't. They had a really poor run in the middle of the season, but because they'd started well, and we've talked about that a few times in this format, uh, and that's helped them. They they're trying to rebuild for next season, and I think Barrow will be quite competitive next season. Featherstone, you know, they finished ended up finishing six points ahead of Lee, which you know you probably wouldn't have said, but um, obviously what's going on, and then obviously Featherstone Lee have got this meaningless match next week for a bit of silverware. I loved uh, a tweet from I think it was Martin Ridyard saying nine aside anybody. <laughs> <laughs> crossbar challenge, I think Cross, he said as well. Yeah. He said that as well, yeah. I mean, he would say that for a crossbar challenge, wouldn't he? he? He'd get it. He'd get it. Quick word on Ridyard, because I think he's now past 2,000 professional points, which is no mean feat, is it? No, yeah. Um, be interesting to see where he winds up next season, whether he's going to stay at Featherstone or whether Lee might try and tempt him back or whether maybe Witness might have a look at him. Witness are signing everybody at the moment. They've been linked with uh, Tangata, aren't they? Tangata, the moment, yeah. So. Well, they've got to sign somebody, Dave. That'd, well, yeah, yeah. But um, McGrath, will you like getting another contract there as well? Yeah, well, they've, they've been dishing them out, haven't they? They've, they've got all the kids signed up, so but they're going to have to sign some experienced championship players, and Ridyard's surely one of those that you'd be looking at. Uh, talking about experienced championship players, I had the pleasure of going over to Doncaster, uh, reporting again for the Hour League app uh, at the weekend, and... 
this was a fantastic game. I just really love this game from start to finish. You got uh, again Doncaster going in front eight 0 early doors thanks to Harris's early try, a couple of goals from Matty Baharel, um, and then Doncaster came. Uh, came a bit unstuck in the middle of the, the first half. Workington roared at him. Brilliant try from Gordon Maudlin. Uh, Wilkes goes over with a go-go gadget arm reach right underneath the post. 16-8 at half-time, but yeah, it was still made really close early in the second half when England scored. Uh, who looks a fantastic prospect. He's only 23. He's already been around the likes of Leeds and, and Salford and Castleford, so he's tasted a bit of Super League, but it looks like he can get back up there, so he's my pick from League One players potentially moving up. Uh, um, Workington then had a, another purple patch in the middle point of the second half where they scored through Dickinson and Hamley um, and eventually won by 30 points to 18 despite a late interception from Tarly who went nearly half the length of the field. Um, I was expecting Doncaster to win that, I'll be honest, but Workington obviously have some really big game players, lads like Fui Fui Mai Mai who give such a, a, an impact, lads like Ollie Wilkes is, a, is just a monster but in the best possible way, he's a warrior um, you know him from his time at Widnes, I know him because he's played at Lee for a long while as well he, he's, he's done well everywhere he's gone hasn't he and I think that what what do you make of working to get in there? Is this a, is a surprise for you? Um, no, I don't think so. I think I think Leon Price is uh, he obviously he knows what it's about. You know, he's a winner. He's a champion. He's obviously attracted decent players there. And I think I think Bradford would have preferred to play Doncaster um, in the final. And I think you know Workington have turned Bradford over, haven't they, this season? Twice. twice. So I think you know Bradford will be a bit worried about. Um, about that, I suppose the good thing for both of these teams is that they know they get another chance the week after. Um, so even if you can't beat Bradford or, or if Bradford can't beat Workton, they've then got a chance against Swinton the following week. And I think, I think the League One teams will probably go into that. I would have the League One teams down as favourites against Swinton just because I think it's a. They've lot, been winning. Yeah, because yeah. I think you, you know you come off the back of a winning season, it's a lot different to Swinton. I mean, Swinton, I can't remember last time they won a game. Um, you know, so I, 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 you've just got to try and make. It's a difficult situation to be in, of course. I mean, um, be interesting to see what happens. Um, but yeah, Bradford worked a really good game this week, and um, is, are they streaming it? Do you know, Dave? That's going to be via proper sports, which right. I think is actually going to be on the Our League app. But they're, right, right. they're doing it um, because of the facilities at Oddsall wouldn't allow two broadcasters to go on the same network right, or something. Right. There's, there's some technicals behind right. it. Let's that. Yeah, I mean, that'd be a good match to watch ahead of the uh, Toronto game, of course, uh, on Sunday night. Um, in the other semi-final, yeah, we've already brought the thunder. It is Bradford Bulls that have made it. 47-0 against Oldham. Game too far for Oldham? Yeah, I think I think Oldham are just... Uh, Oldham are one of them teams, aren't they, where they, they are, they're a solid team. They probably punch above the weight for long periods of the season and um, you know realistically on paper Bradford should be winning that match and obviously it proved Now you've not got to be in your bonnet because every time I mention Oldham Drew usually ends up going on about low attendances and stuff I think oh, they're, no, they're I'm a not, real I'm not I, I'm not bothered about that They're a real sort of like they're a traditional club aren't they yeah, I think that Oldham are one of the clubs that are sort of left in a bit of limbo, aren't they? Because of the the way things are, is that um, you know, obviously, you know, Championship going up to fourteen. There's there's teams left in that League One, like Doncaster are in that same similar boat. Hunslet to an extent. There's teams that are now stuck in League One. That's almost like half a league mm -hmm. because what what how many was in it this year? Fourteen. Fourteen. So it'll go down to twelve. But then within that twelve, you've got West Wales, you've got Hemel. You know, with all due respect to them teams, they've not been at all competitive, uh, and it's difficult, I think, for teams like Oldham and 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 Whitehaven to carry on growing when you've only got half a league to play in. Um, so so it'd be fascinating seeing that competition, and I'm really pleased that the rugby league are doing something regarding the uh, the streaming on it. Not only because they've come knocking on my door, by the way, <laughs> but uh, you know it, it's it's needed, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, that, I, I think it just uh, uh, like my thing is that it's all about just playing. You know, as much as everything's a business, the reason why everyone does it is because it's rugby and you play rugby, and and that's all about. The league tables are the only paperwork that you should really be interested <laughs> in, and I think. That's where I, you know, I said it before. I think rugby league's lost its way a little bit over the past ten years. Where we've had these spreadsheets and balance yeah, sheets also far, rather far, than the tables. Yeah, far we? too much 
you know stuff's being put towards that and i think i think it'd just be nice just to be able to get on with the de- you know three decent leagues look at the results and see what see what happens you know you look at you know you look at say our london scholars our newcastle how coventry are starting to get there having played in that in that league and i think you know it'd be nice to see that carry on i mean i look at i mean i always mentioned the blog i wrote about how things were in 2004 when you had super league hang on we need this hovish music again yeah, we had, da, 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 was it was it da, 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 10 back in them days in national league one so you had, you had 12 in Super League, 10 in National League 1, 10 in National League 2, and then they had the National League 3, didn't they? Which was like a combination of like it was strong amateur teams and expansion One of teams. Yeah, because I mean, uh, Coventry's come through that system. Yeah, which of course was when the amateur game was still in the winter, of course. So you had like... But you had that, that one was, division that was in the summer, That was you? the summer, yeah. yeah. So you had like Bramley playing it, didn't they? I mean, Warrington was in like Wollstone. Warrington was the doing now Wollstone yeah, again, they, yeah. they played in it and you had like Bradford Dudley Hill and, and teams like that. Um, and I, that, <laughs> that was a really good setup. And I think, I don't think Rugby League realised at the time that that was probably the setup mm-hmm. to have, you know, have the main National League 2, National League 1, Super League. You had the National League 3 where... New teams could come in, compete with Heartland teams, and then potentially use that as a bit of a grounding for them to say, like you say, Coventry have done, to say, right, if we win National League 3 and we're ready, we can go up and play in National League 2. Well, could you imagine someone like Manchester Rangers coming through that and then jumping into the League 1? That'd, yeah, that, I mean, that'd be fantastic. Because that, obviously there's this, there's this degree of separation, isn't there, between the, the pro game and the amateur game, because amateur clubs don't want to go pro, you know, pro clubs don't want to go amateur. So it's like, why not bridge that gap by having like a hybrid league where, you know, if Siddle want to eventually get into National League 2, let them play in National League 3 for a season and see how they like it and then move up. Um, that's how I'd look at it. Um, and just, you know, I don't know what's happening with the amateur game in terms of participation. I know a lot of people are still a bit unsure about whether moving it to the summer was the right idea. Um, well, no, I've been around a lot of amateur clubs over the course of the stuff that I've been doing with Lee East over the last couple of years. And generally, the general consensus and the feedback that I get is that it's not really worked for a lot of these clubs. And the thing, I'm I mean, sort of speaking from the heart, though. As well. Well, I think I think the, I think the thing is with with playing in the summer is obviously people go on holiday, um, you know, nice weather, you know, there's you know, there are things like wedding, you know, I mean, I'm I suppose I suppose I'm sort of the age of someone who'd play amateur rugby league, and you know, the amount of weddings I've had this year, I'd have been missing games left, right, and centre. Um, uh, you know yeah, well, I, mean? I know some players that have missed games left, right, and centre. Yeah, they've been on stag dues, yeah, weddings, weddings, and it's like, and of course, like nobody nobody has a register office anymore. They're always abroad. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Where's my invite as well? Yeah, and it, and and I think that's it. It's that whereas on a on a on a freezing cold Saturday afternoon in November, I think you know everyone's there because they've not really got anything else. There's nothing else to distract. So it's like you know, like I say, I think that setup the rugby league had in 2004 was the best setup. You still have the amateur game in the winter. You had the and then it also eases that pressure of players because in theory, Lee in this situation, if the amateur season doesn't start till September, Lee could have registered some of them amateur lads to play for the pro team before the amateur season it doesn't impact then on Lee Miners or whatever do you know yeah, what I mean because you've got Lee Miners heading towards what they're hoping is a promotion season yeah I mean they've got to get over Milford at this weekend actually yeah, but, at Featherstone but, 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 but you see what I mean yeah yeah, like, yeah I do, I do. do you know and so I just think I think rugby league has tied itself in knots when actually it probably had the best structure 14 years ago and they changed the structure because they thought that was the problem when that wasn't the problem the problem obviously is all the other things like the marketing the commercial the facilities and it's like we're sort of getting back towards where we were but i still think it needs a bit of tweaking but that's certainly what i would okay push for um so that's uh, james stuck in 2004 he'll be yeah. he'll be getting what was what was big in the charts in 2004 see i can't even I don't think know. now don't know I was going to say he'll be getting his Spice Girls album out. No, that, you know, that's, that's, that's before. 90s, that, that's that's before. 90s, that, David. Never mind, never mind. Right, okay, forthcoming fixtures. Uh, St. Helens against Warrington and Wigan against Castleford in your Super League semi-finals. Pickers are two uh, um, St. There. Helens and Wigan. Okay. Do, you, do you need me to go points? No, no, I, I'm happy I'll with go, that. Uh, yeah, go on then. I'm happy fine. with that. You know, if you wanted to go points, you could do. But I think St. Helens uh, by seven, Wigan by... Two. Is this because you're trying to get above me in this league? Oh, I've given I mean, up I'm, on that. I, I am about six bottom, so I've not had a great I've, campaign. I've, I've, I think I've missed the last two weeks. I've given up on it. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Um, the million pound game. Where does your, your thoughts lie with this one? Toronto against London. I think we could be in for a cracker. I think it's hard to look past Toronto. I think to home be advantage. Yeah, I think it's. I mean, I, I was sort of thinking, why didn't they just play over here? Because they were both over here, so they both had to fly to Canada. When they could have just held it over here, but then I suppose the home advantage is probably what's going to swing it for Toronto. I think. I mean, I don't think London have got close to them. They beat them at London earlier in the season. They but, did, but, but both times going over to yeah, they've Toronto, been, they've been they've rolled had, over. Yeah, really. and I think I, I, I'm probably expecting the same to happen this week. As much I, as I would like to see London win it, the last game looked a closer scoreline. I think it was 34-22, but I was saying to someone earlier. Toronto were like 32 nil up in that one. Yeah, and just like yeah, so a bit of a shame for London to end it that way. But I think yeah, I think Toronto will, will roll them over, and then obviously then it's like well, what happens next in that in the Toronto project? And obviously that's what we'll all be looking forward to seeing. Yeah, so we'll we'll have all the all the chat after that game next week. Um, the competition nobody really wants to win, Featherstone and Lee. Surely you can't see past Featherstone winning that. Well, no, you'd imagine not. I mean, have, have Lee asked you to play, Dave? Uh, I'm not available, actually. You're not available, no, right? No. no. <laughs> see what happens. Not that I would add anything to I, the team. I don't suppose they've sold many tickets, because I'd, I'd imagine it doesn't count on a season ticket, and yeah, it might be a very sparse crowd. That, again, I'm interested to sort of see the aftermath of that, to be honest. Uh, Bradford against Workington. I'll go Bradford. I think uh, I don't. It's a tough one, though. I think I think I think Bradford. I don't know. I, I think Workington have got a real chance, but I, I think Bradford, having lost to them twice, I think it'll be a bit like third time lucky. I don't think because they know how important this. You know, that's ultimately what Bradford have played all season, and as much as it is for Workington. But I think Bradford know that this is the game they've got to win. And I think, to be honest, I think Bradford. I think Bradford having the knowledge that. If they lose, they've still got a chance. I think that'll relieve the pressure on them a little bit mm -hmm. because I think they know that, you know, obviously, yeah, they'd like to beat Workington, but I think because they know that it's not game over if they do lose, I think that'll enable them to relax a little bit um, and still have the chance. And then, I, you know, I, I fancy Workington to turn to Winton over the following week. I've made a lot of new friends up in Cumbria, so I'm going to go with the Cumbrian element. Um, I'm wanting Ollie Wilkes, who hinted or gave a strong indication that this could be his last year playing. I want him to go out on a high of getting a team promoted. I can see Penke having an absolute stormer again, like he always does. He's still class, you know. Still well, really I think, I think class. We're, I think we're, I mean, Workton have got nothing to lose, really, because no one expected him to be in this position. Everyone's expecting Bradford to win. Bradford need to win, if you like, to to achieve what everyone thought they'd do easily. I think all the pressure is on Bradford, yeah, because yeah. they'll be wanting to do it first of all. But yeah, I think, yeah, I, I do agree that there's pressure on Bradford, but I think it's a lot less than it would have been if they didn't have this second chance the following week. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, but it'd be really interesting to see what happens. With I know, obviously, there's a bit of talk about the stadium at the moment with the football team in Workton, and it'd be really interesting and if they go up into championship and they start competing in the championship, whether that sort of pushes that forward a little bit, um, you know, because the, the, the football team in Workton's not at a great level there in like Northern Premier League, so it's only like seventh division, uh, seventh tier of English football. So, um, but it'd be, it'd be really interesting, I think, to see whether they could, because you'd imagine that Leon Price could attract some decent players. He's obviously got the, the connections, you know, for dual reg or for loans or whatever. So, it'd be really interesting to see whether promotion could really kick start working because they've been a bit yo-yo haven't they over the past decade um, a bit like the other Cumbrian teams have all been like that so is this their chance to now push on push on uh, James it's always an absolute pleasure having you alongside it's nice to see you back thanks Dave okay. good to be here um, we're going to sign off I've just got one more thing to add and it's something that I got tweeted a few times on Sunday which was hashtag UTT up the town Thank you very much. We'll see you next week.